All right, so my talk, I uh, divided my talk up into three parts. Um, the first part is what I call Pollination Biology 101, which is giving you uh, the background of some understanding of the system. And, you know, I'm sure all of you, when you hear the term pollinator, or you've heard the term pollinator before, likely when you hear pollinator, you're thinking bee, and you're thinking honeybee. Um, but as the title of my talk, uh, more than just advice, it's not really about the bees at all. It's about their functional role as pollinators. It's about pollination. And for whatever reason, people use the, the term pollinator very loosely to the point now where it's actually, I think, having a negative impact on conservation efforts and the species that are in decline. And I'll talk a bit about why that's the case as we move along. Uh, but it's extremely important that you understand the system and what are we trying to do? How does the system work before we talk about how we're going to um, protect it and, and um, how to restore these systems that are in trouble? And then I'm going to shift and talk about pollination system degradation. What is it? And um, specifically, what are the goals? What am I trying to do with my research? and um, focus on the data collection and then action. So end on a high note, over the past couple of years, um, we've done quite a bit to, um, to put in the, the proper plants and we're seeing uh, effects pretty much immediately, some of which are, are happening at Breakneck Hill. It's very exciting. Um, and so we're spreading this up. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So what is a pollinator? The, the, as I mentioned, the people tend to use the term pollinator when really they mean flower visitors. So what's the difference between those two things? A wide variety of animals uh, visit flowers to feed on the nectar, pollen, or both. Uh, there are about 200,000 of these species globally. Um, the vast majority of the 200,000 are um, insects. So only about 1,000 are vertebrates, like our hummingbird. And so um, you know, the vast majority that we see visiting flowers are insects. And this includes a wide variety of bees. There are about 4,000 bee species native to North America alone. Thousands of butterfly species and moths. Uh, we also have flies and we have wasps and, and beetles. So a wide variety of things uh, visiting. And the environment that they encounter, shown in the background, there's a lot to choose from. So a lot of things are, if you go to Breakneck Hill or you go to some open area, even a, a roadside, you'll see a lot of things in bloom at the same time. And so those animals are looking to, they're trying to figure out, or need to figure out which flowers offer um, nectar and pollen, which, which flowers are a good source of nectar and pollen. So you can imagine that we've got hundreds and hundreds of these species that are competing for a limited resource, the nectar and pollen. The, the nectar is their fuel, right? it's their source of carbohydrate, and the pollen for those animals, the bees are eating the pollen, that's their source, source of protein. So the bees can't make more bees unless they have pollen, um, but they can survive with, with nectar alone for, for uh, a considerable amount of time. Bumblebee, such as this one shown here, can live three months on, on sugar water alone, but it can't produce new bees unless I have them home. So how is it that these animals are making decisions? There's a, 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 a widespread misconception out there that they have these innate preferences. So if we put blue flowers out, it's going to attract bees. If we put orange flowers out, it's going to attract um, butterflies. And you know, we, I, I look at this and I test this uh, in the lab uh, using what is called the proboscis extension reflex. So here we have a monarch butterfly. If you touch the legs of the butterfly with a cotton swab soaked in sucrose solution, it sticks out its tongue and starts to feed on the sucrose solution. This is an innate response, very similar to Pavlov and, and uh, his dogs. We can then show the butterfly stimulus. Here we're going to show it uh, a yellow, so a color. Um, we could also show it, uh, I've done this with odor, with shape, with combinations of color, odor, and shape. If the butterfly sticks out its tongue looking for food, when we show the stimulus to, to a naive individual, that suggests that there's an innate preference. You notice that didn't happen in the butterfly, so what we do is show it for a few seconds to look for that innate response, and then um, touch the legs with the sucrose solution. As soon as its tongue touches the sucrose solution, it forms an association between whatever the stimulus or stimuli um, are that, that I'm presenting to the butterfly. And then during the test phase, we show um, uh, distractor um, stimuli. So there it's blue. Here we show a color that's very similar to the yellow. We see the proboscis. The tongue is not moving at all. Antennae are intact. So um, when we show the test stimulus, we see a very different response, mm -hmm. right? Almost immediately, the butterfly is sticking out its tongue looking for food. So this is called associative learning. 
And everything from the smallest of flies up to butterflies and hummingbirds are all using associative learning to figure out where to go in terms of uh, what flowers to visit to get food. So the vast majority, there are some species that have these innate preferences and they're you know, maybe two to 5% of species that are out there. The vast majority are learning and relearning. So I could later pair blue with reward and not yellow and the butterfly would switch its preference. Um, the butterflies can remember these associations for over two months. And, um, and so, you know, they're very flexible, even though they have a brain the size of a pinhead. There's a lot of learning and decision making going on, and that helps them to compete with other animals to track these resources and change over time and space. All right, so those that's, you know, looking at things strictly from flower visitors and foraging. Now, if those flower visitors, as they move from flower to flower, transfer pollen that leads to fertilization and the production of seeds and fruit, then and only then can we change the name from a flower visitor to a pollinator? So the term pollinator 100% is from the plant's perspective, yet people, it, it amazes me that in all this pollinator conservation discussion, the decline, the plants are never mentioned. They're, they're sort of a, well, let's just get food to the animal, and we completely have, we've lost the, um, the functional importance of these animals, which is pollination, which is a, a reproduction process in the plant. Right? That's how the plants reproduce. So we have our male and female reproductive organs, the male is producing the pollen, it lands on the surface of the stigma, which is the female reproductive organ, we get the pollen tube growing down, fertilization, and then the production of seeds and fruit. If the pollen transfer leads to the production of seeds and fruit, that's the process of pollination, and if the animal is helping the plant to accomplish this, then, and only then, can we call it a pollinator. Now, a lot of plants, and I can spend another hour talking about plant mating systems, many plants um, can use their own pollen. So if we have, let's say, a bee or a hummingbird or something moving out this flower, transferring pollen, um, it can receive its own pollen <coughs> and it will result in fertilization and production of seeds and fruit. Many plant species are self-incompatible, which means if they get their own pollen, they're not going to get fertilized, which means there's no pollination going on. In that case, the pollen needs to be transferred from one plant to an unrelated plant of the same species, and this process is called outcrossing. If the pollen gets transferred to the plant of another species, Again, pollen is transferred, but there's no fertilization and production of seeds and fruit, so, that, so there's no pollination going on, and so we can't change the name from flower visitor to pollinate. And we're going to see why this is extremely important um, as, as we move along in the, in, the, uh, in the talk. Now, to give you an example, here we have a medium plant. We have two bumblebee species. We have Bombus firmidus right here and Bombus aphidus down here. Bombus firmidus is going into the flower, making contact with male and female reproductive organs leading to fertilization and production of seeds and fruit. Arbomus firmness is a pollinator. Arbomus aphidus is on the outside of the flower biting a hole because it's a nectar drop. Outside of the flower biting a hole, stealing the nectar, and Arbomus aphidus, because it doesn't make contact with male and female reproductive organs, is not a pollinator. In fact, it's a parasite because it's taking the nectar, and in doing so, it's deterring visitation by our pollinator to this, this uh, bombus firmus, right? It'll go in, there won't be any nectar because bombus aphidus um, has already robbed it. So it'll leave without giving the plant the pollination that it needs in order to reproduce. So I could have thousands and thousands of bombus aphidus on my obedient plant and not have any pollination. So we, we, we're not gonna call it a pollinator. We could only change its name if we know that it, we have the plant that it actually pollinates around. It needs to be doing that pollination. Um, we can't hope that at some point the animal is going to find the, the, the plant that it pollinates because if it's not in the habitat, then its functional role is lost. And this is where we talk about feeding animals versus protecting their functional role as pollinators. Similarly, I could put out, if I could invent a feeder to feed all the bees, all the bees in trouble and butterflies and everything else that feeds on nectar, I still would have the same issue because I'm feeding the animals, but they're not doing any pollinating. And the pollinating is absolutely what is important, and that's what we need to, to focus on. We look at a more complicated uh, system, Pineland Golden Trumpet. You hear it down on the, the, this is a list of all the things that are observed, all the species observed on the Pineland Golden Trumpet. The ones in green are the pollinators. So if I remove these three species, I'm gonna have nine species covered with bees. I see bees everywhere. It must be a great pollinator plant, right? No pollination going on. The plant isn't benefiting at all from all those species. I can remove the nine and have one of the three and the plant's gonna benefit because it's gonna have a pollinator, all right? So again, 
pollinator, we need to think about the plant, which is why I prefer to use the term pollination system, because pollination system, and, and I'll talk about that in a second, but it makes you think about the plant. If people use the term pollinator correctly, I wouldn't have a problem, but they're completely ignoring the plant, and that's the important part, and so I'm trying to shift focus um, by referring to things as pollination systems. So let's, you know, we hear these terms all the time, pollinator friendly, this is a great pollinator plant, I'm going to create a pollinator habitat or a pollinator corridor. And in light of what I just said, these terms are really meaningless. What you're basically saying is, hey, I'm going to put, put a bunch of flowering plants that hopefully have nectar and pollen to feed the animals. That's what I'm going to do. That's what pollinator friendly means these days. But to feed the animals, to give you another example, everybody loves their hummingbird views. We can feed a ton of hummingbirds and, and keep those populations going. But if you've got a bird right, that has the choice between visiting these hummingbird pollinated plants, native plants like our Lobelia, Monarda, and, and, and patients. The bird has a choice between visiting 100 flowers to get the same amount it could get in five, you know, in a minute with one-stop shopping. What do you think the bird's gonna do? They're not stupid. They're gonna go to the hummingbird feeder. And when they do that, what's gonna happen to our plants? They're not gonna get pollinated. So we're feeding the animals. Is this pollinator friendly? When we're pulling animals away from the things that they're supposed to be pollinating, the answer is no, right? So if we lose the pollination of the products of pollination, we'll talk about that in a second, by doing this. The same thing if we put in cultivars and we put in uh, non-native species. They're, we're feeding animals. There may be some pollinating going on, but we're gonna see that the products of pollination here, by keeping these, these native plants going, they're out competing and stealing pollinators from these native plants, which are helping to keep our biodiversity going. Uh, and, and also, um, the, even if they did a lot of pollinating, there were seeds and fruit produced in this case, our native species don't want to eat non-native seeds and fruit because they've co-evolved with native plants. That's what they prefer to eat. So we really need to rethink, again, what we mean by pollinator friendly. And are we feeding animals or are we um, keeping or preserving or restoring pollination um, of, of native plants? So looking at the system together, Globally, we have about 300,000 species of animal pollinated plant to complement our 200,000 species of um, flowers and animal. There's a single plant on this side that feeds everything on this side, and there's a single animal over here that can pollinate everything over here. What we see are subsets. Certain plants are pollinated by certain groups of animals. And there's a good fit between the animals and the plants. And, and so to give you an example, here's a, honey, a bumblebee pollinated uh, uh, plant species. Notice the pollen's on its, its back. The reason for that is because it's very difficult for the bee to get to that spot to groom the pollen. But it's the way that the plant is maximizing pollen transfer efficiency, helping in maximizing its reproductive success. Similarly, we have our hummingbird pollinated plant here. Notice that the pollen is deposited on the forehead of the hummingbird. Why? Because if it was put on the wings, it wouldn't be a very efficient system. The, the plant would, would um, incur reproductive costs. As the, the, the nectar is located at the base, which happens to match what hummingbirds like in terms of sucrose concentration, the bird moves to another flower. This is the female part. It moves into position, rubs its forehead against the female part, transferring the pollen, leading to fertilization, production of seeds and fruit, picking up pollen, and then moves to another flower. Here we have a highly specialized system. The nectar is located way down here, off, off slide, long tube. Here's the, the pollinator. It's a fly with a tongue about this long. Here's the pollen. This species is highly specialized, meaning if we get rid of the fly species, the plant species die. If we get rid of the plant species, the fly species dies. They are absolutely dependent on one another um, for survival. So, um, so other, these other systems are more generalized. Here we have a monarch butterfly with the pollen on its tongue. The other thing I want to point out here is that the, you know, we talk about red hummingbird flowers are red because it attracts hummingbirds. Well, so actually, no, that's not the case. Hummingbirds don't have an innate preference for red. What the red is doing is deterring bumblebees. So flowers have a push and pull. They're trying to bring in their most efficient pollinators, and they're trying to deter flower visitors, you know, those parasites are less efficient pollinators. And the way that these hummingbird pollinated plants do it is that, um, first of all, so the bee comes in, it can crawl in and get the nectar if it's got a long tongue, but it's not going to touch me on the female reproductive parts. The reason this flower is red, hummingbird flowers tend to be oriented upright, is because bees have difficulty putting those two things together, and it reduces their foraging efficiency. So they go and try other things and ignore the red flowers because um, they want to, they're trying to maximize how much nectar they're bringing in. Um, and so plants have a, a wide variety of tricks 
to help you know, this, this push and pull. And the reason that we have so much floral display diversity is because that's the way that the plants get the animals to do what they want in terms of maximizing their um, pollen transfer efficiency or reproductive success. All right, so why is all of this pollination important? Again, we're moving from talking about flower visitors and pollinators as just the animal to looking at the system. And this context, I'm sure everybody's familiar with in terms of agriculture, you know, one out of three bites of food you take comes from uh, a pollinator. That's, that's you know, what a lot of pollinator conservation groups uh, numbers throw around and, and they're accurate. Um, but one thing I want to point out in this case, first of all, um, in this context, the honeybee is absolutely the most important uh, pollinator that we have in an agricultural context. Um, and again, it depends on the plant species. We have many native bees, like this bumblebee buzz pollinates. There's certain crops that honeybees don't buzz pollinate, so bumblebees are actually better pollinators. But out of the 4,000 bee species that I talked about, 5% or so are visiting crop plants. All right, so the vast majority of what's going on are the non-native honeybees. And the reason that they're so good is because this is what they have to pollinate. A couple of plant species, one plant species, acres and acres of one thing for two weeks. You need the numbers to get the pollinating done. In each one of these boxes, there's about 30,000 individuals. So you're just flooding the system. So what matters in agriculture is number, not diversity. It doesn't matter how many kinds you have or who you have. As long as somebody's getting the job done, you're good to go. So a handful of natives, handful of, of native species pollinating um, non-native, well, many of them may have had not native ancestors, but they're, you know, um, a few. we've selectively bred them to be very different from their, their native ancestors in many cases, and we're feeding one species, and that's us, and we can throw in domesticated animals if we want. So one side of the equation, everybody's for those got tons of attention. It's very important, not just for putting food on our tables, but, you know, multi-billion dollar a year industry, great. When we switch to the ecological side, which has been virtually ignored, the other important part of pollination, if we go back to these pollination systems, the diversity of, of these pollination systems, what these systems do is provide food, shelter, and nest sites for other wildlife. So if we look at what um, the pollinating going on here, the fruit, the seeds and fruit are feeding small mammals and birds, and those small mammals and birds are food for uh, predatory species. So as we, so the pollination here, the products of pollination um, is, is, is keeping this diversity going and the diversity of pollination and pollination products is supporting diversity of wildlife and, and these other ecological interactions. So as we start to, if we start to erode these interactions, so we get rid of the native plants or the animals doing the pollinating, we have fewer seeds, we're gonna start to see negative effects at these other levels. And eventually we're gonna get what's called ecosystem collapse. That's the, the you know, massive reduction in, in biodiversity. And that's coming, but we have no idea how far along, along we are. We know we're losing our foundation, but we don't know to, to what extent it's impacting these other, other levels, and that's what I'm trying to figure out with my research. So to give you one example, here we have a native rose, Carolina and Virginia rose. The pollen is used by all of the bumblebee species in decline and all of other bees, um, many of the other bees in decline are using pollen again, as a source of protein so they can make new bees. Now, our Carolina and Virginia rose is, is uh, the uh, host plant for the apple sphinx moth. Larval stage is food for many birds. The adult stage, moss, could be food for Easter whippoorwill, which is a bird species at risk. And the pollination products, all the rose hips, are being um, consumed by all of these birds. So just by putting this in, we're restoring all of these connections. That native plant is, you can think of it like the focal point, where we've got the animals pollinating, producing food, and all these other species are depending on that native plant um, diversity um, for survival. So, you know, many argue, well, you know, the, the, the agriculture is important for us, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, there's no, there's no benefit, economically speaking, to preserving biodiversity, why should we care? And um, there's something called ecosystem services that I think definitely depend on and take for granted um, to the point where I don't think people realize what we'll be losing if we don't keep these healthy, diverse ecosystems functioning. Um, so here's a list of ecosystem services. These are things we get from nature for free. So carbon sequestration, water um, purification, soil decomposition, all comes from healthy, diverse ecosystems. And what if we start to lose this diversity, we're gonna lose these services and what's gonna happen is you know, the same thing that's going on in China where they've lost all of their wild pollinators and diversity and they have to hand pollinate 
their crop plants or you know, have drones and drop bubbles with pollen to try to pollinate things because they, they reach the point of no return where they've lost their diversity and they can't support it anymore. So once this is gone, if we can invent something to replace it, great, there's gonna be a significant price tag, but in many cases, we're not gonna be able to do what nature does. And so we're gonna be um, serious problem. All right, so what is the problem then? Hopefully you get a sense of the importance of the system the problem is that we're getting degradation of these systems. Not just in Massachusetts, I'll show you Massachusetts data, but across globally we're seeing these declines. Eastern North America, uh, the species I'll talk about, this is true across Eastern North America. Going and looking at museum specimens pre-2000 to see what was out there at the time, and then I went back to the same sites in Massachusetts and surveyed, and you can see that in many cases the yellow bars are lower than the blue bars. In the case of this bumblebee species, Bombasophis, it's, it's probably locally extinct, although I'm keeping hope that there's still a population around. Um, Bombus trickle, many species in decline. We look at our butterfly species in New England, everything below this line right here is in decline. And if I look at other bees, I'm just going to put it on the slide, same thing's going on. And not surprisingly, our native plants are also in decline. And the interest that are not surprisingly, the plants that are in decline, like this pencil and hirsutus, is pollinated by the bee species that are in decline, long tongue bees. They match up and they fit. It makes perfect, perfect sense. Um, what I want to point out here as well, though, is that there are many cases where the yellow bars are, are um, higher than blue bars. And this means, and this is true of the butterflies, where we see increasing species increasing, and it's the same with the plants. So while many species are headed in the direction of global extinction, other species are. Um, are doing better than they've done historically. They're expanding their ranges. The numbers are through the roof. <coughs> so this points out, I mentioned this before, looking at agriculture is about abundance. The uh, ecology is about diversity. And by the way, in that system, the honeybee, honeybee plays zero role in the ecological system. We could remove honeybees from, from North America. It would have zero impact, ecologically speaking, because they're non-native species. There are no native plants that depend on honeybees for pollination. So while they're absolutely critical for agriculture, they do nothing ecologically speaking. So we need to, to, to keep things in, in uh, perspective. So when you go out, and, and this happens all the time, I get this comment all the time, oh, I, I, this plant I have, it's, it's just, it's a bee magnet. There are tons of bees all over the place. Well, guess what? When you look at the bees visiting the species, there are all these common species like fungus and patients. They're not the species that are headed in the direction of extinction. So this idea that abundance equals health and, and that, that we're doing a good thing, and if we put in a plant that's got a lot of activity, that that's helping, we need to, to change our, our, our perspective on that, um, as I'll show you in a second. So the other thing I want to point out is the difference between a specialist, a rare, and a declining species. So there are many species that, like Bombus tricola, historically Bombus tricola was found from the Cape all the way to, to the border of Western Mass, all through the state in the 80s. Now, I, there are a few populations in Western Mass, and that's it. So this species, over the past decade or two, has rapidly declined and is very close to becoming a, a locally extinct. This species is a specialist on goldenrod. Now, goldenrod isn't going anywhere anytime soon, right? So although it's a specialist, it's stable. The numbers may even be increased, may be very abundant in, in areas, but it's a specialist. Here we have Bombus sandersoni, which is a rare bumblebee species. We, historically, it's been rare. We don't see very many in pockets throughout the state. And present, we see the same thing. It's rare, but stable. So again, the idea that if, if it's a specialist, we have to rush out and help it, or if it's rare, we have to help it, is, is misguided. There are species that are declining, and that should be the target um, of, of our efforts. And then, this is, I'm pointing out the animal side of things, but the same is true for the plant side as well. So what's causing the problem? There are, are a lot of factors that are likely contributing to the degradation. So pesticides have been getting a lot of attention recently. Neonicotinoids you know, from the animal side, herbicides from the plant side, climate change, and disease. Now these, these my lab, by the way, I'm studying all these things and I could talk about each one for an hour. Um, I'm gonna focus on the bottom two for the rest of the talk. But here, the pesticides are extremely, uh, are definitely an issue. There's very clear evidence that neonicotinoids um, uh, can have lethal and sublethal effects on, on insects and disrupt plant pollinator interactions. Um, but these effects are restricted to urban and agricultural areas where we're using these pesticides. Typically not, we don't see a lot of, of 
of the pesticides on, um, on conservation land. Climate change puts plants and animals out of sync. So there are some plants that bloom based on temperature, some bloom based on, on the day length. So if we have a warm spring like we did this past year, things are blooming, and if those animals are photo, uh, depend on photo period when they emerge, we're gonna, they're gonna be out of sync, right? Things will be out of bloom, and the animals that come out looking for it, they're, they're gonna be out of luck, right? So that's how climate change can have an effect in addition to overwintering. Um, disease moving from honeybees, there's, there's good evidence that diseases are moving from honeybees to bumblebees and other native bees, and also increased levels of pathogens, particularly around commercial um, greenhouses where they're using um, uh, bumblebees for pollination. So habitat change and, uh, and, ex and exotic species, how are these two things affecting? That's, that's where we're gonna shift our focus. So here then the question is, uh, well the goal is, um, we wanna change the habitat. So what are we doing to the habitat that's driving these declines? And um, what do we need to do to, to fix things, right? Uh, and so how are we gonna change things? And as I mentioned, there's a lot of pollinator stuff going on. So the question is then, there's a lot of change, but is the change actually benefiting or not? And, and it turns out not as much as, we could, the answer is not as much as it could be. So to understand then what we need to do, and, and this gets missed is, is, uh, by a lot of um, people, is that we need to understand that there are different habitat needs at different stages of the life cycle. It's not all about the flowers. There are other life stages that we need to consider because we're trying to keep the population going. And the population, there are critical, um, critical events over this species' life cycle. For example, butterflies, they need host plants as much as they need nectar plants. Right? If, you have, if the butterfly doesn't have a host plant, you're not going to get the adults to feed on the flowers that you're putting in. So you need to make sure that you have both. In the case of bees, right now they're hibernating. We need to have good habitat for them to hibernate. They come out in the spring and they look for a nest site. We have to have habitat for them to nest. We then have to have the nectar and pollen so they have the fuel and the ability to make new bees through the season. And then at the end, we need to get that habitat in shape for them to overwinter. Each species, so this is looking at things in a general way, each species has a different set of habitat needs. There, this, this idea that one size fits all when it comes to anything simply isn't the case. Each species has, the reason that they have these separate needs is that's how they exist, they coexist. If everything did the same thing, they would outcompete one another and you just have one species left. So we need to appreciate that these species are different. So my research question then and focus is, the species at risk, what exactly do they need? And when I was doing, uh, the first thing that we need to, to know then is, is what are the species that we're targeting? Right? Again, you can't just look out and see a bunch of bees and think that everything's great. You need to know, is that the species that's in decline or not? Because when you make a change, you need to, first of all, you need to assess the habitat to see is it here. And if it is or is not, when you make a change, you want to know that you're helping it. Right? So it's very important. I give a lot of workshops to help people to be able to, if you're given the skills, to ID these species so that they know that they're helping. I don't want you to trust me. I want you to see that you're making a change and tell other people what they need to do. Um, so once you figure out who's targeting, and, and here are all the bumblebee species historically present in Massachusetts, just to give you an example, um, the red ones and red are the ones that are, are in a state of decline. So a lot of different things you can see. Later in the season, you're going to see this one in the thousands, when there should be three or four other ones uh, in the area at the time. So it's, it's extremely important. So I finished my postdoc at UMass Medical School focused on water butterflies. My advisor at the time said I couldn't even use the word bumblebee or pollinator in the lab. I had to stay focused, you know, the Department of Neurobiology is very strict that way. So I finished, got a faculty position and started to think about getting, I wanted to get back in the pollination systems, which is what uh, you know, my main interest. And looking at the conservation issue, I noticed that there's a major problem. This idea that uh, so this is a, a plant list from pollinator.org. I could have put up one from Xerxes. I could have put up one from, from the state. It, it, it is a common problem. I mentioned to you that we have to think about the native pollination systems and the pollination of native plants, and then you look at what people are telling you to put in, and it's all non-natives. This is feeding animals. This is not restoring ecological connections. This is not conservation. You're, it's conservation if you want to conserve maybe one species, but not the functional role as a pollinator, which is the important part. Also, we look down the list. Bombus verbis, the ones in trouble have long tongues. 
Red clover is what's keeping Bombus firmus alive in the state. Otherwise, it would be locally extinct as well. Yet it's not even checked yet. So bumblebees, just go down the list and pick a few things and you're good to go. I'm going to show you that this is absolutely incorrect. Um, so what is it then? You know, and I've, I've before, you know, I, as was mentioned, I've been studying um, these systems for, you know, 30, 30 years, over 30 years. Um, so I know what the, the bumblebee species in particular. I saw Bombus aptus decline and disappear. Um, so what what we know is that these species are, um, you know, they have different tongue lengths, right? So if we look at uh, oh, I, guess, uh, I don't think I say anything. Um, so if we look at this species, medium short tongue bee on our goldenrod, goldenrods and, and similar flowers are open. With a short tongue, you just probe around, you're going to get your nectar, right? We look over to the uh, our long tongue species, like our Bombus purpose, the one that's in trouble. And this is jewelweed, right? The nectar is located at the base of the spur. Bombus purpose has a long tongue, you can get the nectar. Our short to medium tongue bees can't get the nectar because their tongue, right? Remember back to that fit? So our short to medium tongue are going to be on our golden rods and asters, but our, our firmidus is not going to be on our golden rods and asters. Why? Because it has a long tongue. It gets in the way. It can't compete with short to medium tongue species. So I can be planting, and this is always on the list. Let's load up on golden rod and aster. You can, you can have acres and acres and acres of golden rod and aster, and you will never see a bombus firmidus on those plants. Um, so we need to put in the jewel weed if we're going to uh, support our bombus firmidus. And, and so I knew these patterns existed. You go out to the field, you, you, you know what these species like, uh, but I need to get more data, right, to convince people. So in 2015, I started to collect data from May through October at sites across the state. So my high elevation sites are in orange, blue, uh, our low elevation stage breakneck is one of them, shown here. Basically what I do is I walk transects across the entire property and observe the bumblebee species and the flower that it's interacting with. And have I've been doing that at many sites at Breakneck since 2015, other sites multiple years, multiple sites. This is what I started with and now I'm, I'm expanding to other sites. So this is what I see. And as I said, we're recording the different species. And what I found, this is just for one site, H7, which is in Western Mass. Short, medium, and, and sorry, the, the long tongue species here. And it matches up as I would predict, right? The long tongue bees, the ones in red, are the ones in trouble, the species in trouble. Burbis and Bagans are visiting the veteran red clover. Bagans also is visiting Prunella vulgaris, which is a native. Medium tongue, short tongue. What's interesting here, though, is that within these categories, there are preferences. All of these bee species work around at the same time. All of the plant species were available at the same time. In fact, I saw 25 plant species with a bumblebee visiting collecting nectar. Of the 25 species, each in each case, the bumblebees were observed more than 50%, 60% of their observations were on one or two species. So even though they could, they don't. And this tells us, they're telling us what they want. And so we, you know, makes sense to give it to them, right? In the case of vegans, though, we see these interesting patterns come up where even though know, veg and red clover are available for vegans, and I see it on veg and red clover in other places, when Brunel is available, we start to see vegans on, on Brunel. Similarly, in Patience loves white clover along with honeybees, these other species aren't going to touch it. So the, the second part then um, of this was I mentioned that I wanted I needed to get more data quickly so that we could get plants in the ground, figure out what's going on, and help. Um, and so I, I started the ecology project. The initial part of the ecology project was to get people to collect data. I teamed up with faculty and, and students from WPI um, to, to develop this web app. We're now teamed up with iNaturalist, and so we're bringing iNaturalist into the app so we can expand from bumblebees to butterflies to other bees. We can do the plant, animal, the behavior, the interaction. All of this is going into our database. Um, and again, I could, I could give a whole talk on that. We're developing curriculum at the high school and middle school level that, that's Students will participate in this project, and, and um, um, a lot of good things going on. Anyway, from the perspective of data collection, if we look at the data that I've collected, and there, we probably have four or 5,000 observations at this point, 
Notice Firmidus is doing exactly what I found it to do with my um, highly controlled um, and rigorous field studies. Cal veg and red clover. Bombus tricola is on milkweed. Bombus vegans is on veg and red clover and prunella. So even though the citizen science is are give, they're giving me data from across the state in a less rigorous way, the, the, the preferences are matching up. And so that, that provides strong evidence that, that these species are, are looking for a subset of species. And with all those data together, I generated my plant list. Right? And from my research alone, there are 18, over almost 19,000 observations that went into this plant list. And the plant list is 100% data driven. If something comes up, I get data saying something should be there or should not be there, I will change the list. It's as simple as that. So I'm going into this with a lot of confidence based on data, but you never know, right? It may be, you know, the, the, the real question is when we put these plants in the ground, do we, do we see the species at risk showing up? So that's where we're, we're headed next. next. But to give you an example of some of the plants on the list, and the list is available on my website or I can email it to you um, as a PDF. Just to give you an example of what we should be putting in, in the spring, lupin and woodbetany, again, with those long tongue species or nectar robbers, into the penstemon, cercidus, and digitalis, to monarda, through to the jewelweed. Right? That's nectar. Pollen, they, they prefer different plants for pollen. They're not using the same plants, so we have to make sure we give them the pollen plants. And in fact, there's more competition for pollen plants. In the spring, willow, male, that's producing the pollen, extremely important, into the native roses, into meadowsweet, and into the St. John's woods. Um, th those, that's, that's what we need for the, poly the, the pollen. So this is what our habitat should look like, and I can guarantee you if you go into a pollinator habitat, you're not, you may see Monarda, maybe Pensioner, but you're not gonna see a lot of the rest of this, because it's just not, the lists aren't data-driven, and they're not thinking about things in the same way. So the next part then is, is, so the goal too then, and I've added these goals, is to assess habitat. So when you go into a habitat, um, what system, the question is what systems do you have, what should I put in? And this is where know your targets goes um, a long way. Here's uh, Breakneck Hill, right? There's some purple loose stripe down here that I surveyed for multiple years. Thousands and thousands of honeybees and bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee that numbers are through the roof. Did not see any. Firmus and vegans. When I did see them at breakneck, they were on red clover and vetch, and I would see one or two an entire season. Maybe zero an entire season. There was a season where I didn't see a single bombus firmus on site. All right. So what, well, I didn't do it. Uh, Freddie did it, and, and the, the town did it, and I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, but remove the purple loose stripe, and three years later, what happened? All of these native plants grew up in its place, and here is a video of monkey flower mimulus, where there used to be purple loosestrife. Now there is a huge population of mimulus. This is one plant. That is Bombus vegans, and that is Bombus furbius. I don't see them together at all, and I rarely see. Uh, you know, I see one Bombus furbius here. Here I see both of the species at risk on one plant, and there were multiple individuals foraging on the mimulus. So. A pretty dramatic change from what I was seeing at Breakneck, and all these plant species also were released, if you will. So there's no sense putting in plants to remove the invasive that's suppressing native diversity. Look at what you restore these connections um, with, with the native plants. So that was um, extremely um, exciting. The other thing is that, you know, again, I mentioned about the honeybees being competitors. If we look at it from an ecological perspective, we have limited resource, nectar and pollen is limited. Pollen more so probably than nectar. There's only so much to go around and you're gonna get what are called ecological winners and losers. And what I see time and time again around April 15th is the honeybee numbers go up from one or two, 10 to thousands on a site. And, and so what impact does that have? Well, here's Monarda uh, fistuloso rubra. This is in Lincoln. Um, and before, the, so last week of July, this is the observations. I saw a lot of firmness and vegans, species at risk, foraging on the Nardo and a few carpenter bees. Now, carpenter bees, like our Bombus apnus I talked about, Bombus tricola, they're hole biters. So you can see it's biting a hole face of the flower and robbing the nectar. Honeybees have an extremely short tongue. Honeybees came on the scene. They weren't there before because they can't get to the nectar, but now they, this has opened up the resource. 
So the following week, literally in one week, we went from zero honeybees, there were enough holes and they recruited, that there were uh, almost between 100 and 150 individuals at one site. This is like a one hour, half hour observation period. So, this, and, and guess what I didn't see? Were the Bombus berberus and Bombus bagans. They were pushed off the plant species altogether and were observed uh, at lower numbers foraging on, on red clover and vetch that was surrounding the rubra. We see the same thing. So, so Malcolm, tons of activity. And if you look at the ratio of honeybees to other things, it's a 10 to 1. This is the common bumblebee, the one that's doing really well, and it's still outnumbered 10 to 1 on, on uh, Mount Mid. And if you look at Golden Ground, we see similar patterns. So we, we need to think about competition and try to minimize this so that we can protect these species. All right, so the last part then is, is, is looking at um, restoring and protecting. And, and, Effectively, it's looking at my list, looking at what you have, what species you plant species you have, what you want to put in, and putting in those species. Now, the one, one thing I want to point out is that when I say put in native plants, I'm talking about straight species, not cultivars. Why? Because cultivars are not the same in turn. Remember, the name of the game is nectar and pollen, and these cultivars do not have the nectar and pollen in the, the, that's the same as their straight species. All right? So here, this is some work from Andy White, University of Vermont. I've seen this and been burned by nurseries many, many times telling me this is a straight species and it's a cultivar and it's not producing any nectar. The problem with the cultivars is when you're breeding for one thing, you have to give something else up. If you're breeding for show, the first thing to go is going to be nectar production. And that's what we see in, a, in, in many, many cases with the native cultivars. It also changes the plant chemistry, so it doesn't taste as good. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. So this is just giving you an example of cultivars. So what Annie did was, was looked at echinacea. So here's the straight species, here are the cultivars. So the, the, the bars color matches the flower color. You can see that in the case of bumblebees, that in some cases they're, they're not even visiting the cultivar. Right? Significantly reduced visitation. Now why is that? As I mentioned, it has to do with the nectar. So more work by Annie. Here is Lobelia cardinalis. Here is the hybrid cultivar. Looks pretty much the same to us. We think all oh, What's the big deal, right? Well, the big deal is here's the nectar content in the straight species, and here's the hybrid cultivar. Pretty much no nectar. So our hummingbird's going to come in, it's not going to feed, and, and so this plant is going to get pollinated, assuming that the pollination products are going to be the same as the straight species. So should focus on the native just to be safe. And this happens more often than not. And this isn't a one-off. And I've seen it in, you know, I could list five, six species where the same thing with the no nectar in, in cultivars that was, was this other one. All right, so I've got the list. So what? Is it having, would it have an effect or not? COVID, one of the benefits of COVID is that people had a lot of spare time and uh, wanted to get outside. So I used this to my advantage and said, okay, let's create some habitats around the state. So Dartmouth, South Rose, Breakneck. I know Freddie doesn't like this picture, but it gives a good job of showing that we've got 40 acres, and this isn't a very big plot, right? This isn't a very big plot in Dartmouth. There's a lot going on over here. It's a community garden, a lot of other things in bloom, but we don't see any of the threatened species or that low numbers. Put in plants and plugs. As soon as those plants started to bloom last year, so I put it in the spring and then bloom later, who shows up? All of these are pictures of species at risk visiting plants within these plots. From here over is breakneck. This is um, this is dark. So there's vagans, there's furbus, all doing their thing in those plots. So this was remarkable to me that there was pretty much instant success with putting in the proper plants. Now breakneck has two other pollinator gardens. I've never seen a furbus or vagans in these traditional pollinator habitats. So we put in this habitat, we see them immediately. Right? That's how dramatic the effect is. And I'm, it's not just South or Dartmouth. I'm seeing this across the state. People are putting in these, these habitats, and it's, it's really, really, really benefiting these species at risk. Uh, year two, you know, some, some more videos. Showy goldenrod, which is a great plant late in the season. It's not the same as the other goldenrods. <laughs> and um, back up, this is Bobus vagans that's visiting. This is Pensamin hirsutus, which actually is a plant, native plant species at risk. This is Bobus vagans. And in the same patch, Right, this is at Dartmouth. The same, I've got to do the pollination experiments. Um, that's why they're back to the flowers, but they're bottom's purpose. So again, you put in the plants that they want, 
and they show up. And, and so, and, you know, this is very exciting, and I'm hoping that people will start to put in the plants and, that, you know, things will start to grow, and I think we'll be in really good shape in five years um, if we continue in that direction. Now, what I want to finish with um, is, is, again, not, we have to think about the whole life cycle. And in the case of bumblebees, they're, uh, the one Bobus Burgess is in trouble likes to nest in tall grass. Right? So this is uh, Dartmouth Natural Resources Trust. Because of COVID, they didn't mow. And they didn't mow. And what did I find? A nest, a Bobus Burgess nest, which is right around this, this um, costume. They mowed this every year. There was no Bobus Burgess. They forgot one year and didn't because of COVID. And there was a nest. I told them not to mow again this year. And guess what? There's another nest over here. So if you can see that it's not much tall grass, you don't have to mow. So if you had an area to mow, if you mow this part one year and this part the next year, you're able to keep that habitat going. What's going on is bumblebees don't dig their own nests. They're looking for abandoned rodent nests. And if you mow, rodents go underground and they can't use them as a nest site. They want to nest on the surface. You have tall grass, the rodents are nesting on the surface, and there's a nest site. Pithy stems, if you're going to, you know, things like uh, Joe Piley for, for other bees and you want to have some bare ground sandy soil the ground nesting bees. This is hot off the presses. This picture was posted um, again in Southborough. This is St. John's Wort, Shrubby St. John's Wort, the native in the pollinator in the pollinator preservation habitat based on, on my plant list. This is a white throated sparrow. And I pulled this in today. I didn't realize that this is a species that's in decline. So populations are decreasing in this area. And this species likes, needs cover, likes to nest on the ground, and is likely loving these native plant seeds. Um, and so this is extremely encouraging. We're not only are we helping those native species at risk, we're making those connections with the next trope of love. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take your questions. Um, you had mentioned that China was in collapse, and I was wondering what caused that. Uh, habitat destruction and pesticide use is were the two major contributing factors in the agricultural area. So, so we're talking in the last 50 years? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and the apple industry specifically. Yes? So on your website, I've spoken pretty a little bit. You know, one, of, one of the challenges you like to learn is which rose bush is the right one versus the rose Or having, you know, I had a place where I had a beautiful uh, mound or a large patch of lupin, but it was the wrong lupin. So, does your website also kind of provide guidance as far as how to get your hands on either the right seeds or the right plants? Yeah, excellent question. So, when I started, um, so I've given this talk a few times in South Carolina. The last time I was trying to get together. Yeah, partner with nurseries, and the good news is I, I have done that. So Blue Stem um, Nursery has uh, is going to have all the plants on my list. Which one? It's, it's called Blue Stem. It just started up last May, okay. and they're actually going to mark the plants that are on my list, so it's easy to, to find them. So they're really um, supportive of, of what I was doing. Uh, Out West, Lee in a Prayer um, Nursery, and um, you know, if you ever have problems getting plants, there's there's New England. So the, to answer your question, I need to put a list on the site. So great suggestion, and I plan to do that. The reason I haven't done so is because I wasn't at the point where I I trusted the the, the nursery. I've talked to a lot of nurseries, and they're not going to move away from cultivars, and they, they don't want to have anything to do with native plants because nobody cares about native plants. They tried it a few years ago, um, and and so hopefully that that they'll. <laughs> you know, realize that there are people interested, but I, I do need to get that on the list. But they are out there. So if you want to email me with a specific plant, I can tell you where to get it because I've most of the plants on the list that need to be. Yes. Um, the MCA native pollination system task force has a database of all of Rob's plants and all the nurseries you can get either seeds or plugs. And I'm only mentioning that because certainly we're going to. Prayer and um, Blue Stem. They're newer, but what happens is 
with everyone looking for these plants. It happened to me. Like, people asked me, where can you get them? I told them, and then I couldn't get them when I wanted them. So the next yeah, time order I, early. Yeah. The next January, time someone asked awesome. me, I said, I'm not telling. Um, but just kidding, we have a list because okay. sometimes it takes, like for the library pollination garden, that's eight nurseries at least. Really? Wow. wow. It's getting easier if you plan ahead um, and with more nurseries coming on. But I can, um, anyone who isn't, if anyone's on Facebook, sign up for the Native Plant Gardens of South Coral because we post these resources and I can actually make sure everyone here gets the other website, which is the Native Pollination Systems Task Force, which has that database. <coughs> North Northeast Pollinator Plants is another good one you order. I've ordered the last three years, and the plants are really good. They shipped here to your door. Um, that's another one. And then, I still ship? need to get the list. Of what was the shipped here to uh, Northeast Pollinator Plants. It's that's the one that I got sold out of. It's out of Vermont or um, New England. <coughs> yes? Um, So why is the question? Because they can get access to the nectar. And so I'm looking at nectar chemistry, and, and, and I'm doing that actually today. I collected more data on that. And it turns out that the, there are um, volatiles in the palate of nectar that, for whatever reason, are really attra more attractive to the bees than what's in the capensis. So if those two are together, they're going to prefer the palate, but they'll still visit the capensis of the by itself. So it's the nectar chemistry. So if, you, if someone was reading a garden that feels available, Preferred to put um, versus Right. So, so good question. So, I don't have a lot of data on Palata. I didn't talk. I don't have any data on Palata. So, if you have a good population of Palata, please observe bumblebees and get it into ecology because that's what I'm using to put Palata on the list. And it should be on the list. But I, there are things that I think should be on the list, but I'm not doing so until I get data because everything I do is data driven. So, that's why I need the ecologist or tell me where the population. Of um, Palata is because then I'll start some observations and look at the preference. I'm sure it's there. It's just that I, I'm trying to to keep that. Data that I, uh, had to plant myself. Um, I found because I found a huge patch of it in a in like a roadside ditch in Westboro actually mm -hmm. near like the highway. So I collected the seeds and. Really if you wanted there. to let me know where that that patch is, if it's if you think it's wild, um, then it appears to be wild. Um, That'd be great. Uh, it's yeah. in like a patch of golden rock. Yeah, perfect. And, and so when I bring up another uh, good point, that is that when I give these these workshops, I'll go out and I'll say, okay, let's go out and which, which plant do you think is the best pollinator plant? And we narrow it down and people will see that these long tongue bees are on the, the, the palate, but they're not touching the golden rod and aster, which may, there may be a small patch, like literally I've seen three prunella plants with a big ants on it, with Everything else you can imagine around it, and they're not—they're not on it. They, you know, that's how strong these preferences are. So. Um, and one last question: is, I know for a lot of our like collecting surface and stuff, a lot of the rare species um, move to hilltops because it's easier for um, them to find mates if they have like, themselves on hilltops. So do you think that's mm -hmm. another reason why altitude is like such a role? So, so, so another good question. I, I think that overwintering is what's going on. I think that they're not reaching the the temperatures that they need for overwintering or snow cover. That their cold temperatures when we get these fluctuations that it's killing them off. And so they're at higher elevations because of the snow cover they're able to, to complete their cycle. Um, but certainly what you suggested is a possibility. If you need a lab to join for grad school, you know where I am. <laughs> Any other question? Any other questions? Yes. Um, 
I just read many papers that the macro of the bees in many countries are being affected by herbicides, insecticides, but most seriously by glyphosate. What do you know about that? Yeah, so are you doing anything about that? So I'm not, I haven't, uh, that specific chemical I'm not um, studied, but at this point, I mean, generally I'm looking at people that have used it and what the diversity looks like and what impacts there are. Um, but, but chemicals, all chemicals affect something in a negative way and do so differently. And certainly I'm familiar with the literature looking at effects of pesticides on microbiomes and how that may affect immune response and a variety of things. Um. I am concerned only because here in South Korea, we have decided that it's okay to spray near the fields or even near the school, uh, round up, round up flow, and razor, and another one. And yet, nobody is doing the research to investigate. As the person of your I am asking you. Is there any opportunity in your lab to do this research? Certainly. I mean, well, there's a lot of literature out there already looking at the negative effects on insect diversity, and insect diversity is crashing. So I'm looking at a small chunk of the bigger picture. Um, and, and I think there's enough out there already to make a case that it's going to reduce diversity. So I can send you some papers. I I testified yesterday to the state. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then you're way ahead of me. 4,000 papers. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have read uh, a few years ago that neonicotinoids can attach the, uh, themselves to dust particles that could get transported hundreds of miles. Right. And is that, is that, I didn't hear hundreds of miles, but that that definitely, in terms of the, it, there's no question that it, it moves from application site to, and, and contaminates wildflowers adjacent to where it was applied, and it gets into the groundwater, and there's a lot of literature on, on how that particular um, pesticide moves around and, and affects on non-target beneficials. So, um, I didn't hear the hundreds of miles. So that's. I'm not sure how they would have established it. It was from the site 100 miles away and not one in between because it's. Sure. Well, so I, think that, yeah, I think that the application of the unit isn't that great here in Massachusetts, for instance. Yeah. And that, that somehow it's showing up in, uh, in causing, probably causing some honeybee collapse, <coughs> a colony collapse. Right. And the speculation was that the only source was somewhere from outside of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not familiar with that. All right, well, thank you again for your attention. And uh, if you have any, think of anything, email me. Happy to answer emails or calls. Before I go, I just want to make a note pitch for the Open Space Preservation Commission's work. We are having a winter sow workshop where we give people the seeds of just from plants on Dr. G. Beard's list. You can, um, our native plants like to be a period of freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing, to break dormancy, to germinate. So you put them in these milk jugs and put them outside and forget about them all winter. And then in the spring, you can have many, many plants. We did it last year. We think we had thousands of plants as a result. This Saturday, we're going to be cleaning seeds at the um, Public Safety Building. So if you want to give me an email, I'm on the town's website, fgillespie at southboroughma.com under the Open Space Commission, or check out the Facebook group and let me know 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. We're going to clean the seeds so we can start distributing them. If that interests anyone, we can use help. And we'll be uh, masked, safe distancing, and open windows. So um, I'm hoping you Just to make sure what day is it? Saturday. The 20th? The 18th? Did I say the 18th? I don't know what day is it today. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Saturday. Whatever it is, it's Saturday. Yeah. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I'll turn it back over. I just want to give that little plug. So it is the 18th. Uh, 
Saturday is the 18th. It's the 18th Saturday at public safety or email. Before you go, tonight was a scientific presentation of the research project in town. Mark your calendar for January 19th is our next speaker series. And guess who is going to be the person to actually show us the doctor is going to is doing his research. She is going to be the speaker of Rotary Club Speaker Series January 19th at the old fire station, and she's going to tell us exactly what's about we need to do. And one thing, I go back to David. Thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to be here. And most important, I'm a part of both. I am a volunteer at the Bills and I am a volunteer at the library. As a senior citizen, for heaven's sake, can we get the young people out there to help? <laughs> because I just cannot bear anymore. <laughs> And, and I try to remember the Freddie said, uh, we are putting this and this is for plot Acacia. I cannot remember everything. <laughs> the young people, we need young people to get involved in ecological and related projects in town. It's very beautiful. Please help us. Thank you. So, that's for open up the day to reduce the service. I am just so proud of you. I'm just proud that I met you. I was there. I will always start everything that you have been doing before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming.